You are. 
Still in your 
you, Jesus, for this time of worship and providing a place where we can come together as a community and honor and serve you. God, prepare our hearts as, um, for communion and um, thank you for paying the price that we can never afford to pay. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, you can have a seat. And then children, you are dismissed for Children's Church. So you can start heading out. It looks like there's some Ryan and Laverne have the orange wands. Follow them out there. I don't know if you guys are following along in our, um, our challenge for the year, our spiritual development challenge. But if you're following along with the new in 24, um, today we are in the middle of 1 Corinthians 11. And this is where Paul is actually addressing, if you read this morning, Paul's addressing um, the church in Corinth about approaching the Lord's Supper, this time of communion, just with an unworthy heart or an unworthy manner. So I want to read that real quick with you guys. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I think too often that we live in this state of ignorance. We have in our minds our own interests and not the interest of things that are God's interest. And this puts us in a willful state of ignorance. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, I must think back and set my mind on what transpired for my sin. I can't just ignore the brutal beating and the death on the cross that Jesus faced. The price for my redemption was real. And I challenge you guys today as we head into this time of communion to not just go through the motions or enter this time in an unworthy manner. Christ's command, do this in remembrance of him, should make us examine ourselves. And I must look internally to see if there's any sins in my life that I might be harboring onto or that are unconfessed. And then I have two options. We can either confess it and repent of those sins, or I can let the cup pass by me. It's better to not participate in communion than take it in an unworthy manner. So over the next couple songs, we have stations set up in the front and the back of the room with crackers and juice. If you're a follower of Christ, we, in, we invite you to participate. But I challenge you during this time to do some self-reflecting. Not to just go through the motions, but examine yourselves and repent of any unconfessed sins that you might have in your life. And remember the price that was paid for you on the cross so that one day that you can spend eternity with God in heaven forever.
Cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see His wounds, His hands and His feet My Savior on that cursed tree
so, so much. We cannot wait until you return. And until that day, we will wait. And while we wait, we will praise still. No matter where we are at in our lives, Lord. Give us the strength to praise you, whether we're in that valley or we're on that mountaintop, whether we're in a storm or we're not. Speak through Pastor Kale as he gives the message to your people, Lord. And we love you so, so much. Amen. Church, you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, thanks again for being here today, whether this is your first time, uh, your first time in a long time, whether you're here in the room, watching online, or you're part of our Colby Church, uh, so glad that you are here this weekend. If I haven't had a chance to meet you in person, my name's Kale. Uh, I serve on staff as the Connections Pastor, um, and we're in the third and final week of our series called You of Little Faith. And if you happen to miss the first two weeks, uh, you can go back on, on, on our app or our Facebook page or whatever and, and catch up. But in the first week of this series, uh, Pastor Derek talked about worry and how worry is really one of the great enemies of our faith. Um, and then last week, Pastor Brandt told a story from scripture about a, a father who had a son who was possessed by a spirit. And this, this, this spirit would, would cause the, the child to fall into fire or into water in an effort to kill him. And so uh, a desperate father brings his son to the disciples who in previous chapters had been able to, to heal people, but for whatever reason, uh, they weren't able to. And so G, uh, this man brings his son to Jesus and says, if you can have pity on us and, and just do, do something, and Jesus responds with, what do you mean, if I can? Do you not believe? And the father says, I do believe, but I need your help to overcome my unbelief. And so fitting with this theme of you of little faith, right? This you have so little faith. We're going to look at a, a story in Matthew chapter 16. And so if you have your, your Bible with you or your, your C3 notes, I'd love for you to open to Matthew chapter 16. Um, and like Pastor Brandt talked about last week, um, the cool thing about Scripture, especially within the Gospels, is you have a, one story that is written about in a couple different spots and from a couple different vantage points. And so we're really going to center in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to jump around to a couple different uh, uh, versions of this story as we go. But I'm, I'm the kind of guy, and maybe, maybe you are too, not the kind of person, maybe I should say, um, kind of person. I, I love hearing about the context in which the scripture we're reading about. Um, and I know context is really important, especially like in, right, in school, you have the context clues. Um, but context is super important. I, I love hearing what leads up to the story that we're reading. So I want to give you just a little bit of context this morning as to what leads up to Matthew chapter 16. So we, fast, we rewind uh, two chapters into Matthew 14. And at the start of this story, John the Baptist has just been murdered. He's been beheaded, and so Jesus hears about this, and so he decides to try to get off and go al be alone to grieve and to mourn, right? Jesus experienced the full spectrum of human emotion, and so he, wanted, he needed to grieve and to mourn. Um, but people found out where he was going. When he arrived to hit the secluded spot he was supposed to be at, a great crowd had gathered. And Jesus being Jesus, he has compassion on all of these people. Scripture says he has compassion on them and he heals their sick and, and just for good measure, he takes five loaves of bread and two fish and turns it into a meal for 5,000 men and their families. It's a pretty Jesus thing to do. And then after, after they feed the 5,000 and the disciples gather all the leftovers, he tells the disciples to go back across the lake 
while he stays put and tries to be alone. And so the disciples start on their, their journey across the lake. And if you know the story, there's a storm that happens and the disciples are freaking out. And all of a sudden at 3 a.m., they look out on the water and they see, G they see Jesus walking on the water. And then Peter, in an act of brilliance and bravery, says, I want to do the same thing. So he asks Jesus if he can come out of the water and Jesus says, yes. And so he starts to walk on the water. But Peter sees the storm and the wind and the waves around him and he begins to sink. And Jesus says, you have such little faith. Why do you doubt me? So they fast forward to Matthew 6, 15, and we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the, the Pharisees are mentioned throughout the Gospels, um, but they're religious teachers, and they, they're asking Jesus a whole bunch of questions and really interrogating him. And there's all these different people. There's a woman who has a demon-possessed daughter that gets healed. And all these different people, they, they experience the grace and the truth and the healing of God. And then in another just act of Jesus being Jesus, he takes seven loaves of bread and feeds 4,000 men and their families. And so all of this leads us to chapter 16. And the, the start of the chapter, we're going to start in verse 5, but the start of this chapter is the Pharisees and the Sadducees once again interrogating Jesus and asking for some sort of miraculous sign that would, that would prove Jesus' authority from heaven. But Jesus says, like, only an evil and adulterous generation would ask for a miraculous sign. So then he, he tells his disciples in, in verse 5, he says, later as they crossed to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered they had forgotten to bring any bread, which I think is highly ironic given that they just had a ton of leftovers from feeding 5,000 and feeding 4,000. We'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> but they crossed over and they forgot to bring bread. And Jesus says, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. At this moment, they, who are the disciples, began to argue with each other because they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, you have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Do you, don't you understand even yet? Don't you, you remember that I, I fed 5,000 with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and large basket, baskets of leftovers you picked up. Why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So I say again, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then at last, finally, they understood that he wasn't speaking about the yeast and bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, we put ourselves into this story just a little bit. It's been a long couple days for Jesus and the disciples, right? They're emotionally, physically, mentally exhausted. They're, they're, they're experiencing the full spectrum of human emotion, right? And, and they've, they've experienced Jesus performing miracles while even in the midst of his grieving the loss of his friend. And there are people everywhere. You ever get tired of just people? Just me? Okay, sweet. Must be a pastor thing. Uh. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Um, he tried to get alone a couple different times, but just inevitably someone needed something. And, and you know, the disciples, just because they're, they're not all there, they're probably giving Peter a hard time for not knowing how to swim. And, and like, there's all these different things that are happening in this story. And I, I think it would be safe to assume that that, that Jesus is probably experiencing some frustration with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're demanding these signs and these miracles and they're interrogating them. And, and this, this, all these interactions are fresh on Jesus' mind. And so he warns his disciples and he's warning us, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, I think one of the reasons that I identify so well with the disciples is they don't always get it right away. And neither do I. There are a lot of times it, it takes, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hard-headed, I'm pretty stubborn, and it takes me a while to actually understand what I'm supposed to learn, but the disciples, they actually start arguing about bringing, it's like if you go on a road trip, right, and you have the cooler in the middle seat, and you're like, who brought, no one brought the bread. Weren't you supposed to pack, no, you said you were going to pack the bread. I thought you were going to, I thought you said, and then my wife gets mad, and we have no bread. 
And so they're, they're, they're more concerned with the physical. They're more concerned with their immediate needs where their question could have been or maybe even should have been, what is it about the, the yeast of the Pharisees? What is it about what Jesus is trying to tell us that has the potential of undermining my faith? And once again, Jesus is like, I, I've, I, I've got to spell it out for you. You have such little faith. And then Jesus, just to kind of help our, the disciples remember what has happened, he recalls everything that's taken place in the last couple of chapters. And so I want to jump over to Mark chapter 8 and read what Jesus says, because it's a little more pointed. And I think for us today, it, just, it might ring a little different. It says, aware of their discussion, we're going to be in Mark chapter 8, verse 17. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? All right, think about it for a minute. The disciples have, they're, they're on the heels of 5,000 men and their families being fed by five loaves and two fish. And then 4,000 men and their families being fed by seven loaves of bread. All these different miracles that Jesus has performed. And he says, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. So he said to them, do you still not understand? See, far too often, we talk about this a lot, that a lot of times we're focused on the physical and the tangible instead of having some sort of eternal perspective. But Jesus is saying, beware of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But I think it's really important to, if, if he's warning against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I think we have to understand who these people were, who these groups of people were. And the Pharisees, like, they're this group of religious leaders who followed the rules but didn't recognize Jesus for who he really was, right? They were, they were convinced that if you follow this, this litany of rules, this long list of rules, regardless of whether they were from Scripture or they were man-made, as long as you follow the rules, you were in right standing with God. Their entire objective was to be noticed, right? To put on a show, to... to so you could judge the book by its cover and not what was inside. Okay, so their whole objective was to be noticed and to build a spiritual resume that was better than my resume and that was better than your resume. That was the entire objective of the Pharisees. And we see a glimpse of this in, in Luke chapter 18. There's this Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, if, if you've read uh, the Gospels at all, you know that the tax collectors were the, hated they were the worst of the worst. Scripture calls them the notorious sinners, right? So you have this tax collector, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the Pharisee, and they come to the temple to pray, and, and this is what Scripture says that the, or excuse me, that the Pharisee prays. Thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector, after all, I, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. Flip over to the, the tax collector who is confronted with grace. And he doesn't even have the audacity to even look up when he's praying. He says, Lord, forgive me for I am a sinner. So you have these Pharisees who's all about making sure that other people are less than that they're more. They're full of pride and, and self-righteousness and, and legalism. And what happens is if we find ourselves and what we find in the Pharisees that what pride and self-righteousness and legalism does is that it fails to be amazed at grace. It fails to be amazed at grace. 
because they, they didn't care about the people they were leading. They would, they would make up rules and laws, and then they would actually exclude themselves from following those rules and laws. And, and Jesus goes to the point in, in, in Luke 12 and in, here in Mark 7, we're going to read in a second, he calls them hypocrites. Right? You say one thing, but do another. And here's what Jesus says about the Pharisees in Mark 7. It says, Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they, they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. And then he called to the crowd to come near and hear. He said, all of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. And there was Old Testament teaching that there was certain things you could and couldn't eat. And there were certain ways to go about cleaning animals and all these different rules and regulations. But Jesus is saying that it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from your heart. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. From, and for from within, out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. You see, the, the Pharisees were really, really good at displaying this outward conformity to the law, right? They played the part. They covered the outside really well, but their hearts were full of unbelief and sinfulness. And they honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. And later in Matthew 23, Jesus actually calls them whitewashed tombs, right? Who looked good on the outside, but on the inside, they were spiritually dead, they had this legalistic mindset and heart. And the crazy thing about it is Jesus had a whole bunch of run-ins with, with the Pharisees. And they, they witnessed the miracles of Jesus and they, they witnessed life change as a result of encountering Jesus, right? But yet, they failed to be amazed at grace. They failed to be amazed at the, the grace that was extended to the least of these Right, because if we remember the, the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee, the Pharisee, like, I'm not like those people. I'm not like those people. They're beneath me, but Jesus extends his grace to the least of these. And so Jesus finds it appropriate and finds it necessary to warn his disciples and to warn us to be, be aware, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Be aware of these great pretenders of devotion. Right, a lot of times, I mean, Scripture uses and Jesus uses metaphors so brilliantly. And this, this yeast is, is just a symbol or a metaphor for evil. And just as a small amount of yeast can make a batch of bread rise, so this, this hard-heartedness and this pride and this legalistic mindset and heart can, can permeate and contaminate our hearts. And I think where we're confronted with this is that we're not so unlike the disciples or the Pharisees, right? It's really easy to, to stand here and to have an us versus them mentality. Right? Oh, the Pharisees, yeah, they always get it wrong. Oh, yeah, the disciples, they're, they, they don't quite get it all the time, but they eventually do. But I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not like that. But how often do we look at physical, tangible things instead of looking at things through a spiritual lens? Right? How often are we, are we praying or seeking for something that we, we need, need, instead of thinking on things that are above? Or the Pharisees, how often do we, do we play the part? How often do we look together and look put together on the outside, but for some of us, we're spiritually dead on the inside? Right? We go through the motions, we check things off the spiritual to-do list, but nothing changes, Right, it, it's, it's, it's really easy, right? Let's be honest. It's really easy that instead of uh, being amazed at grace or trying to grow in our faith, it's really easy to sit down and scroll 
and watch episode after episode until Netflix asks, are you still watching? That's how you need to look at it from now on, right? Not are you still watching, are you still? It helps. Um, it's really easy to, to scroll on our phone just mindlessly with these, and all these influences, right, that we're ingesting. It's really easy if you, if you go somewhere and you drink yourself to the point that you're numb to any of the hurt and the pain and the loss that you're experiencing. But I mean, the problem is that sometimes, most times, that feeling wears off and you left, you're left empty. And the hurt and the pain and the loss still exists, but maybe now it's even more, more real and more raw. And Jesus is telling us, like, why, why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? I'm not talking about what you're filling your belly with. I'm not talking about any of these physical things, but I'm, I'm talking about your heart. I'm more concerned with your heart. Right in Mark chapter 8, like we just read, it says, are your hearts hardened? See, the, the, the gospel, the good news is meant to change us from the inside out, not the other way around. Scripture says that, that while man looks on the, at the outward appearance, right, man looks at the, the book by its cover and makes the judgment based on that, that God looks at the heart. Because your heart determines the course of your life. Proverbs chapter four says, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them, but let them penetrate deeply into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. And then it goes on to tell us how we can start doing this. It said, avoid perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. And don't get sidetracked, but keep your feet from following evil. So the question that we have to answer for ourselves, right? I can't answer this question for you, you can't for me, but the question we have to ask ourselves is what is it that needs to change in my life, right? What is it for me? What is it for you? Do you need to guard your eyes, right? Are, are you ingesting stuff and it's made it from your head to your heart? Do you need to unsubscribe from a streaming service or delete an app or two or maybe even add an app that helps provide accountability? Do you need to guard your ears and your mouth by, by what you listen to, right? Podcasts, music, the influences and the people around you. Do you need to create distance between you and someone else who's speaking lies into your life? What about your feet? Right, are there places that we literally need to stop going, that we need to deviate from in order to realign ourselves with Christ or even maybe align ourselves with for the first time? Or maybe there's those influences in your life, right? The scripture talks about beware of the, the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, their, their teachings, the way that they do things, right? It's really easy to go onto YouTube pull open a sermon, watch it, but not check it with scripture, right? I can do all things through a scripture taken out of context, right? It's really easy to do. It's really easy to take a, a scripture, twist it to fit my narrative, but miss the context of what it's talking about. It's really easy to incorporate popular theology into my personal theology without making sure that it aligns with what the Bible says. It's really easy to excuse actions and behaviors or to, to bypass certain parts of scripture or to, to pull certain parts out of context to fit my narrative and just to justify my behavior or a particular feeling or movement in society. See, we believe that the Bible 
is clear, that when the Bible is clear about something, we're going to live according to that. And if the Bible, if there's something that goes in opposition or contrary to what the word of God says, we're going to call that for what it is, and we call that sin. Which means that if it goes in, contra- if it goes in contrast to what the Bible says, we call it sin, that means that sin isn't based on my personal preference. It's not based on your personal preference. It's not based on my motives or, my, or popular opinion by my, my past actions or based on pride or past experiences but it's based on scripture. So how's your heart? Right, the beauty of, of the gospel is, there's a, there's a, I, think it's in, I think it's in 1 Samuel. Ezekiel talks about that God can give you a new heart. He can take out your stubborn, stony heart and give you a heart that's, that's responsive and tender. God can give you a new heart. And it's not just behavior modification. Right? It's not just acting well for a little while, but nothing changes. This is the heart is the center, the epicenter of everything that we are and do. So it's a matter of the heart. And that's the beauty of the gospel, that it changes us from the inside out. That is the beauty of the good news. Now, I don't expect you to raise your hands, but how many, how many of you would be willing to admit Again, you don't have to raise your hands. How many of you would be willing to admit that, we f- that you fail to be amazed at grace? Right, because at some point along the way, grace just becomes just grace. Forgiveness becomes just forgiveness, and then, and then eventually Jesus becomes just Jesus, right? Right? It's really easy to stop being amazed at grace even though we experience it every single day. Or how many of you would admit, I I know I would have my hand raised, that it's really easy to become numb to the gospel, right? Going in day in, day out, work, kids, whatever it is. It's really easy just to go through the motions and to cruise control our faith until something goes sideways, But the beauty of scripture and the beauty of the gospel is that grace is available. Now, I don't know if you do this, but I do this a lot. I I like screenshot or save like tons of stuff from like Facebook. Anybody else do that? Just me, cool. A few down here, I see you. I had screenshotted this, gosh, a long time ago and I had forgotten about it and I was scrolling the other day. Unfortunately, I was scrolling. Um, But I found this quote. And it says, you want to know how the gospel works? This is how the gospel works. The apostle Paul, who was once Saul, who was killing Christians left and right. It says the apostle Paul was entered heaven to the cheers of those he martyred. That's the power of the gospel. That the apostle Paul entered heaven to the cheers of of those he killed. That is evidence of a life that has been changed from the inside out. That is a life that has been amazed at grace. And that's a life that I want to live out in my day today. I want to be amazed at grace. Not just behavior modification, Right? Not just acting the part, but I want to be amazed at grace. And here's the beautiful thing about grace. Grace is not a pedestal that we get to stand on and look down at other people from. Grace is a platform of invitation that points other people to Jesus. And we've all been given a platform. Your platform is going to reach people that mine will not. And my platform will hopefully reach people that yours won't. And so if we as the church can work together to be amazed at grace, man, the impact that we would have. Right? What, what, to what length are we willing to go? And I say we. What length are we willing to go to make heaven crowded? All right? It's not just going through the motions. It's not just cruise control faith, but it is being amazed at grace to the point that it changes us from the inside out. And some of the ways that's evidenced by us through 
the fruit that we bear, right? The fruit that we bear, the, the way that we live our life is evidence of a life that has been changed from the inside out. Jesus is far more concerned with our heart. He's far more concerned with changing you from Saul to Paul, from sinner to saint, transforming us from lost to found, from anonymous to a cherished son and daughter. So what is it for you? What is it for you? Maybe it's, maybe it's time that we take this, a, a deep dive and do a spiritual inventory, an honest spiritual inventory. And if you're wanting a place to start, there's a perfect scripture here in Psalm 139 to help you get started. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. So the question we wrestle with, right? The question we wrestle with is, as Monday comes and a new week happens and we're, we're real life comes back into play is how is your heart? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the truth that we find in it, even if they're hard truths. Lord, I pray that you will help me, help us to be amazed at grace again. And to not take it for granted, to not just expect it or assume that it's there. Lord, help us to be amazed at grace. And Lord, as we experience grace, Lord, may we be changed from the inside out and use the platform of grace to point people into a deeper and more meaningful relationship with you. We praise your name. Amen.